57talk.com, Gary Cubetta, Scottsdale, Arizona, and it's my pleasure today to have recent WWE Hall of Fame inductee, Bill Watts. Bill, congratulations. Well, thank you. It, uh, it's been a long time coming. Well, yeah, I don't know what took him so long. I mean, you know, I've been ready since I came out of the womb to be in the Hall of Fame. But, you know, they finally got around to it. I enjoyed the, I enjoyed the entire weekend, the event. I got to see people I haven't seen in years. Got to be one more time uh, around the business a little bit to see how it's grown. I mean, without a doubt, WWE has a, a merchandising and a promotional machine that is just, just I bet you Vince, even though he's a visionary, I bet you he did never dream that it would be as big as it's been. He he had I know he had a, a concept of it, but it's gotten that big. And then it was really really great to see some of the guys I hadn't seen for a while. So many of them had worked for me or worked with me, and and then to watch the match that I thought stole the show at uh, WrestleMania between Undertaker and Shawn Michaels because it was old school, and they just did a masterful job. I enjoyed watching the match like a fan. It indeed was old school, and it shows you that what uh, you did in the 1970s and 1980s can still work today. The the concept, the best match on the card, a real old school wrestling match, and it stole the show for sure. Well, yeah, the, the, you know the, the the psychology of professional wrestling has never changed, uh, and it, and 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 what the people desire has never changed. It's just it, they have just changed how they present it, but. Uh, the basics are still there. The, the guys have the desire to go out there and do the work, and, and, and they work very hard, and they take unbelievable chances. It's just that it's changed in how it's presented, and, uh, and, and that's all. I mean, it's still the same spirit. Bill, April 9th, 1987, after a long and courageous battle, the UWF, Universal Wrestling Federation, is sold to Jim Crockett. Mm-hmm. Uh, take me back to 1987, and basically the terms of the sale. Oh, gosh, I don't remember all that. The, the, the concept, the reason of the sale was that we were caught in a mega trend. We were expanding. And, uh, and you know, people that haven't been caught in a mega trend don't understand it. They're starting to understand it because America's again in another major mega trend where the entire country is feeling it. Back then, it was the oil thing, and the oil collapsed. The, the oil market collapsed, which it, the oil went down to eight dollars a barrel. Most state governments were set up on twenty-dollar barrel go- oil to break even. So you ha- and at the same time, Ronald Reagan, the president, and I don't think he was that great a president. I thought he was a great speaker, but I thought he killed us. He amended the tax code, and up until then, you you could deduct any interest for anything you bought off your taxes. And he did away with that. And he didn't grandfather anybody in who was doing the legal and the, and the, and the way it was done. They just, they just wiped the books on you. So every single real estate investment trust, real estate, back then your, your, your banks operated on loaning money based on equity and properties. Well, then all the properties went upside down, and the banks had more property than they could ever do. And so banks were failing. Brand of Airlines went down. Hotels were failing. It was so bad that all entertainment started avoiding the oil states. They canceled all rock and roll shows, all country western shows, everything. We were averaging a hundred thousand dollars a gate in Oklahoma City, and about sixty thousand a gate in Tulsa. Oklahoma City dropped to uh, oh somewhere around fourteen or twenty thousand a gate, and, and Tulsa for some reason. Dropped to about thirty-seven thousand a gate. That's just upside down. Everything went. We did a Superdome show, and basically all we did was walk. What we had done in the advance, we had no walk up. It was, it was just a, it was a devastating time. And then at that time, Vince's thing was hitting, and he was not in the oil states. Uh, uh, he, he was on the East Coast, so they didn't feel all that, and they and they wouldn't have understood it because they didn't feel it. So, what what happened? We were in the middle of expansion, and our syndicator he went broke. Everybody was going broke, and, and so we were in a place where we either had a choice of, of either selling out or shutting the doors. That's just how simple it became. We could do one or the other, but we couldn't survive. As a matter of fact, I started losing $50,000 a week, mm. and I lost that from the first of the year in 87 until when I sold out. So Jim Ross came up with a, with a sales plan. Jim was always a brilliant, brilliant guy. He was my right-hand man. 
and we executed it, and Crockett came to the to the table, and uh, so we sold, and not dreaming, and really not knowing how to do the things we needed to do. If you, if you were doing it all over, you'd have got the sale insured and all this, but I mean, here's a promotion that had been there, was established for years, had been successful for years. You didn't dream that he was going to go out of business, too, and of course, he did. then he ignored the very concept of the sale was where he could... From okay. the NWA versus the uh, Universal Wrestling Federation, and have his own in-house uh, competition or his own in-house wrestling war that would have great, great box office appeal. Which I was telling because I was in the situation with with the Georgia thing with the Gunkles and Paul Jones, and and I and and we were we were both selling out in Atlanta at the height of it. All it did was create a greater wrestling awareness, and I told him that, and that's what his concept was, but they didn't do it, and so, and Jim Crockett, in my opinion, uh, couldn't book anything himself, so he was always a prisoner of who his booker was, and he had a great booker, but he had no way of controlling him at the time, so they went broke. Okay, Bill, here's where I want you to stop, and I, I originally asked you about the terms of the sale, and I know it must have been complex, but I, I, have, right. a, I have a bigger point here that I'd like to get to, right. and that is the effect of corporate America on professional wrestling and WCW. Can you give me an estimate, uh, just a rough estimate of what type of money was supposed to come to you, the UWF? No, three? no, that's none of your business. You can't do that? No, I won't. Okay. I can. I can do whatever I want, but it's none of your business. Okay. That's my private financial business. Okay. Then let me ask you this: Did they pay you in full? He paid me according to the terms of the contract till he could no longer pay me, and then he and then he he had, was taken over by Turner Broadcasting, and Turner Broadcasting made an arrangement to pay me some more. Did I ever get as much as I was supposed to get? No. Okay, that's what I wanted to get yeah. at, and and the reason I wanted to get at it is I've heard a lot of different stories. One is that Crockett went bankrupt and didn't pay you at all. That's not true. Okay. So Crockett didn't go bankrupt. Well, I, I don't know if he went bankrupt or not. He paid me until he couldn't pay me. And then when he couldn't pay me, uh, uh, he had, he had, I had made a deal with Ted Turner for my wrestling on Ted Turner's deal. And then I and my, then to me, Ted Turner broke the deal. And he, he and Crockett somehow got together. And it was rumored or told me that Crockett gave him a million dollars to, uh, to take over my my position with Turner Broadcasting. So Turner and Crockett were already in bed then. So then Crockett, Turner then took over Crockett's commitment to me, but he had me by the short hairs because he said either that or either take this or we will, or, or we'll give you your assets back. Well, sure. by then the assets were so intermingled, there was nothing there that I could have picked up that would have been worth anything. So I was kind of at the mercy of Turner Broadcasting on the deal. So they paid me and and I just went on about my business. You know, I took my I took my lick, but yeah, I, I still got a lot of money. Okay, that's fair. I, I, what I wanted to just get at was was whether or not uh, uh, Crockett had filed bankruptcy, and then I don't uh, I don't remember. Not, I don't remember not he filed bankruptcy or not, not. Not personal WCW, and then Turner had picked it up, and you said no because Turner took over from there. Fine. Uh, you, your involvement with wrestling at that point ended for yeah. just, for the short term. Mm-hmm. Uh, were you frustrated? Uh, did you miss it? No, I was ready to get out of it. I was ready to get out of it. I, I uh, had other things to do, and uh, you know, I was ready for the lifestyle change. Uh, a lot of the things that I was going through in my life, uh, in the wrestling, as much as I loved it, there were a lot of things that in the business and ancillary to the business were that weren't the best influences for me. That I'm that I was very much drawn to, and I wanted to change my lifestyle and try to save my family. And uh, it just happened to be that I didn't get that done. Yeah. You were in the aviation. You were in aviation. Yeah, I, because I had my own airplane, and I kept it there, and I had a dear friend that had a fixed base out there, and, and he brought me in as a partner, and it was a great deal. And then the same thing that was killing the wrestling business was, was the oil thing. When the oil thing went upside down, it was like a faucet turned it off because they – all the corporations started getting rid of their aviation department because it was just so it was so dramatic. It was just unbelievable. I mean, unless you were in a mega trend change and, and experience. I remember the Sheik was in it years ago in in Detroit when the automobile industry was upside down and nobody understood why it was so bad. Well, 
if you shut the automobile industry down, which, by the way, I'm not for the bailout, but the bottom line, if you shut the automobile industry down, it not only affects the manufacturers, but it's all the ancillary people that are, that are supporting that industry and making their living off of that industry. It shuts it all down. And so, you know, the Sheik was, was going broke in, in, for, in, in Detroit and had a horrible time, and we didn't understand what his problem was because he just didn't understand how one industry could so dramatically affect the entire community. Well, I, that's what was happening here. Well, I, Bill, I think oil. people can see throughout the entire country now it's kind of a mega trend. That's right. That's and, what I said. Now they're going to get a taste of it. They will get a concept. But back then, they didn't. Here's another thing that people don't realize. When you're in one of these things, the normal ways that you do your checks and balances on your business are no good. You don't, you're, you're blaming yourself because that's what you've learned to do. You're always trying to adjust yourself because. You figure it's up to you to make the difference. But when you're in a mega trend, no matter what you do, doesn't make a difference. I have a son-in-law right now that owns three car dealerships. He is dying. And I keep telling him, I said, you know, you just got to keep doing what you're doing because it's not you. It's the industry. It's, it's, it's the economy. It's everything together right now. So everything you used to do to measure yourself by has no validity right now. And that's the hardest thing of all because you have no way to say, well, did I work this? Did I do this promotion right? Did I do this right? What could I have done better? It doesn't make any difference. It's, it, a lot of it is based strictly upon the mega trend or the economy right now. Well, and this is one of the reasons I, we wanted to talk to you so badly is because for years people have said that Bill Watts fell behind the times, that Bill Watts. No. Uh, well, hold on. Hold on. People have said this. I don't care what well, people. People, name me one person that said that that has run their own business in the industry. Well, there's probably none, Bill. But, there you go. Okay, let me finish. Recently, we've su- we've suddenly seen a lot of things that have proven that maybe and probably you weren't really behind the times. For example, you went to work. We're going to talk about it in a minute with Time Warner. May of 1999, Time Warner stock at a split adjusted price of 220. Today, it's 22 dollars a share. It's dropped 90%. This is the company you worked for. We're going to talk about it in a minute. It's something that has crept up and attacked all of America. And uh, that that's really what I'd like to illustrate, Bill. Yeah, no, I understand. I, You know, I think, again, I'm always amused at what people say about me or how I ran my company or how I ran a business and have no basis or uh, being an authority on it, but they all become an authority in their own mind. But, I mean, it's so simple. You know, I had people for years, wrestlers, that could, they could tell me how to better run my company. And I used to say to them, if you're so smart, why don't you go buy your own company and run it? You know, because they just have no concept of what it takes to run a company. They don't pay the bills. They don't have a clue as to what the bottom line is. Well, when you're not in the day-to-day battle, it's easy to uh, just sit back and, you know, pick sure. your spots. <laughs> Absolutely. Bill, you're out of the business. As anybody who's been successful in a business, you have a a difficult time adjusting to new things, new businesses. Because, look, some people, they have a real skill in one area. It's difficult to translate that into another area. Did you ever think, hey, maybe I I should get back into the wrestling business because I'm one of the best, if not the best in the country at running it? No, because I, I, I dabbled with it twice at WCW, and then I worked three months for Vince. Oh, well, Bill, your head. I, I, this is before you went to uh, WCW. Uh, like, no, uh, I was happy doing what I was doing. Okay, okay. I was happy doing what I was doing. It just WCW was a good opportunity at a time that I thought, you know, yeah, why not? Yeah, I, I learned how to, you know, I made some mistakes like anybody does when you start into a new industry, and I started into the... Uh, into the home-based business industry, and it's a it's a very unique industry, and most people don't understand it. And and certainly, I didn't understand it fully either. But I did make the transition, and I became successful just off of a lot of personal drive. And so, no, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't looking to get back in the business. Jim Hurd takes over. He runs WCW. Three or four pretty dark years. Uh, the pretty pro- dark. Yeah, pretty dark terrible. years. The promotion's not doing well. Everyone's complaining. Uh, WWF at the time is getting is getting ahead. Uh, finally, Jim Hurd is taken out. 1991. Kip Fry, who was an attorney with Turner, is brought in. Very popular with the sheet writers. And there's still this clamoring for the return 
of Cowboy Bill Watts. I remember it very clearly at the time, Bill. Everyone wanted to see you come back. They like Kip Fry, at least the sheet writers, but they knew that if Cowboy Bill Watts came back, that WCW would have a chance against Vince. What led you to come back and return with Turner? Uh, Tim Cox, uh, who was Ted's private attorney, who had been, been a friend of mine when I was in, in Atlanta, because as you recall, I owned 10% of the Atlanta promotion until I sold my share to Ole Anderson. And uh, uh, Tinch Cox called me and because they were in a jam and, and they knew it. And they, were had, they were losing $8 million a year then. And Tinch called me and, and uh, he said, uh, you know, I've been asked about this because Tinch was the one that represented Georgia Championship Wrestling in the Gunkel litigation. And that's where he and I had met. And uh, we got along really, really good. He, he's really a, a decent, sharp guy. I don't say that about many attorneys. And uh, so he wanted to know if, if I would come and, 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 and consider it. And I said, yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, right now I think I would. And so uh, he set up a meeting with myself and Bob Dew. And I really like Bob Dew. And I was to be given total autonomy to run the wrestling operation. Only Bob Dew was my liaison between that and the, and the North Tower or whatever they called it with, and because Ted had put wrestling under a guy who I think is a complete idiot of uh, a name Bill Shaw or something I think I didn't him boy I thought what a, I don't know how you could you couldn't go trolling and find somebody who was as dumb as he was but that's neither here nor there but anyway so I was the one guy that's supposed to have the autonomy to run the business and that was a great and then the other thing was believe it or not this is how silly and crazy things are they the, the they there was two things they asked me about one was the interview taken out of context about Lester Maddox. So that was asked to me clear back before they hired me. And we cleared that up out of context of how stupid it was because with my track record in wrestling already, I had done more to enhance the black athlete in pro wrestling than any promoter in the history of it. And so for the, for, you know, so again, it was, it was all I was saying was, that I hated the fact that it had that 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 who you sold or who you had to sell to had to be legislated. That it should be the free market that would decide it. And I did not agree with Lester Maddox's position on racism, but I said at least he's committed enough to what he believes that in order instead of having the government tell him what to do, he closed his business. And that was taken that I was saying a racial remark. I certainly wasn't saying that, not at all. Never, never, ever. I mean, because, like I said, it happens, just happened that my absolute closest and best friend at the time was Ernie Ladd. So, I mean, and, you know, and, and everybody knows the history of Junkyard Dog and so many others. And, and so that just didn't, so that thing was brought up before I ever went to work at Turner Broadcasting and WCW. So it was cleared and everything was fine with them. So that wasn't even an issue. The other thing that they wanted to know was, could I fire Dusty Rhodes? This is th these guys thought Dusty Rhodes now was in control and he was the problem or the cause of all their problems. Could I fire him? And I said, certainly I can fire him because I can book. I don't have to have Dusty to book. Yes, I can fire him, but that's not the issue. I have no problem. Dusty is extremely, extremely talented. He is one of the most talented people out there. He's a great, great piece of talent. The only thing I, I said, I can fire him if, that's, if that is your criteria. However, I think it would be foolish. The thing I want to do is go look Dusty in the eye and say, Dusty, I am now the boss here. Can you accept that and we work together? And so they said, okay, as long as you can fire him, we're okay with it. And you do it, then your way, you're running it. And that's what I did. I went to Dusty and I walked in. I said, said I'm the new boss and... And you're on the your 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 fanny's on the line, and uh, and I said, but all I want to know is, can we work together like we've done before? And he come around his desk and hugged me and said, you bet you, let's hook him up and go. And that's just how it was. That's just how simple it was between he and I, because we knew each other. I knew what a talented talented person he was. I also knew my responsibility because Dusty is one again that, in my opinion, didn't have a real good concept of bottom line. Never had. He understood how to draw money. He just needed some extra guidance, and, and anybody does. 
anybody needs a little extra guidance and needs to look at it from a perspective of, 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 of where it makes some sense and where there's a bottom line. So that's what happened on it. That's, that was the only two things that were even discussed prior to me being hired there was could I fire Dusty and this deal about the uh, Lester, Lester Maddox article that later was come back and Shaw was going to use it like it was he found the Holy Grail or something. Okay, but, we're going to get to that, Bill. Yeah. When you when you first walked into the building, Turner, the the corporate uh, environment, did you think that this might be a problem, or were you, was it just optimism from day one? Uh, I thought that I had the deal that I had, and then you know it, it was quite a move to move over there and everything, and then and then when you get there, Bob Dew was great. The problem for me with Bob Dew was he also ran the Omni and was gone a lot. And he was not there when, a lot of times critically when I needed him. But bottom line, the Bob Dew and I got along wondrously. The, the, the thing that I found that started happening, I have never been a person that worried about the arrow shot in the front. I realize when you're doing, quote, battle or when you're, or when you're building a business or when you're out there, you're going to get those. What used to kill me was the arrow shot in your back. And at Turner Broadcasting, that was the major thing. You were always having to do damage control. I mean, when I, I finally found that Bill Shaw was totally untrustworthy, in my mind, what he wanted to do, Bob Dew made more money than he did. I made more money than he did. He deeply, deeply resented it. And so Ted had put him over us, and I think that he wanted to get rid of Bob Dew or certainly crush Bob Dew to where he wasn't making that kind of money. So he used it, in my estimation, he used his position to start building those traps. I mean, that's, to me, I've never had much trust with human resources people. It's they kind of like, it's always that they're always basing their deal on, on the traps they build around the employees. I don't think many people really have good feelings about human resources, and I've never experienced it because I've never worked for a major corporation. I, th- I think, Bill, that's been expanded to corporate people in general today. Uh, well, so, you know, I mean, I was on good grounds here. And, yeah. But anyway, that was the bottom line. But I was committed then, and I'd started doing changes. And then, you know, I was trying to fire people that weren't doing good jobs. And I'd fire them, and they'd get rehired. Everybody there had an angel somewhere. They had somebody in some other corporate deal of Turner's that would say, oh, no, he's my guy. You can't fire him, including the accountant. I mean, the accountant's trying to tell me how I can book wrestling based upon it. he was. He, I had to get his approval, is what he was saying. Okay, and it was just it was just all that stuff was so stupid. Bill, let me ask you: when you walk into WCW, the talent level, how what was your instant evaluation of what you had to work with? Well, we had good talent. The problem was they had atrocious contracts. It's like to me, it's like Turner Broadcasting had said. Okay, to the agent, you just take it and write any kind of contract you want, and that's what we'll sign for your guy. And in the concept of it, you ended up with a contract that had that was just stupid. I mean, they, they, the guys got paid based on the contract, and there was no control. There was they could get injured and not work. It didn't say they had to take rehab. It didn't say they had to do this, do that. It was like a free gratis thing that. They could abuse it any way they want. There was absolutely no con. There was no concept of personal responsibility. I mean, there was none. They could abuse that, and you had nothing that you could say or nothing that you could do. They could sit home and collect their contract. It was it was ridiculous. I, I can imagine you sitting at the desk reading through some of the contracts oh. and just throwing them up in the air. Oh, yeah, well, you know, I've, again, I've, I've, and this is stuff that is my opinion, but a, a dear friend of mine in the legal business said the guy that ran Turner's legal deal was a guy who had not made partner at a certain major law firm in, 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 uh, in Atlanta. So what it means, if you don't make partner in a certain time, they let you go because they consider the fact that you're not any good. And he became the head of Turner Broadcasting Legal. So I tell you, it had a lot of, it bore a lot of fruit with me because when I looked at these contracts, I thought, I, you'd have to be a complete idiot to make contracts like that. I mean, there was no consistency among the contracts except how inconsistent and how and how how totally skewed in the favor of the athlete. Turner Broadcasting, they were they had they had no control. Bill. So we started trying to implement some controls. We started saying if you got injured, we were going to set up rehab. You had to go to rehab. Hmm. Then Ted wanted the wrestling cleaned up. He wanted no steroids. So we did a, a put in a, a real true drug testing program. Had five of the top top guys test positive. I was going to use that to break their contracts and and start getting some control of this. 
And not that it was an animosity toward them. It just made a good sense to let's get some of these contracts out. We, we, you can't operate a business based on these contracts. And so then their, them and their agents started raising heck, so Ted never signed off on the, on the drug policy. Mm. And I think three of those guys are now dead. So anyway, we, had a, you know, we, we started having all these messes and stuff. The next thing is was talent didn't know how to work, the new talent. So I started setting up the small shows close by where they could go to these towns and they could work in the ring and people have people that were listening to the matches and they had to go long matches where they could start learning how to do the business. And, and uh, look what Vince is doing today. He's trying to do the same thing because guys have to have some place to get experience besides on TV. So we had a lot of problems. And then the next thing is they wanted to get rid of some guys that had been there too long, so they had a deal where they would buy these guys' contracts out. I, I let Jimmy Garvin uh, get paid off for, for his contract because I didn't need Jimmy. Jimmy was a great kid. He was never any problem. He was a super kid, but we didn't need him. He'd been there, and, and, and he was limited in the scope that we could use him. And he, he loved it. He took the money and went and got his, uh, his airline stuff, and he's a captain of, a captain of an airlines now. So... It worked out good for him. It worked out good for us. And they had a lot of lawsuits. They had a lawsuit with Terry Funk. We got that settled. So we settled a lot. Of anyway, the bottom line is, in, in the 11 months I was there, we reversed an $8 million loss and brought it in at a $400,000 loss in 11 months. And I couldn't even get a letter of accommodation from my boss, not Bob Dew, from my boss in the North Tower, Bill Shaw. I could get no acknowledgement of, of what a great job we had done. Yeah, and you and you then know what the next guy did. But, when I, okay. my understanding, he lost eighty five million dollars. We're going to we're, we're get to that, Bill. We're going to get to that. Now you're working with WCW, and the same people outside the business that were so excited about Bill, the return of Bill Watts. I remember again very clearly at the time they turned on you quickly. Uh, they were upset that you eliminated some of the things such as the mats outside the ring. Oh, I know the stupid the stuff. The jumping stupid, off. The, stupid stuff. The yeah, ju- that's because they don't know anything about the business. They've made a new niche for themselves, and so they got to be the eternal critique of something that they've never done. In other words, it'd be like me criticizing uh, Tony Romo because he took Jessica to uh, friggin' uh, on a week off. He took her to Mexico, and that's then caused him to play a bad game. I mean, that is about as stupid a thing as I have ever heard, but that's the kind of crap that these sheets come up with because they don't know shit from Shinola. They've never been there. And so that that's the same thing that happened. And, and the bottom line is, if they only understood the business, first of all, the mats around the ring never did a damn thing for anybody. They didn't do a damn thing for anybody. We worked in, on around the rings my entire career that had no mats. I'd rather not have a mat than I'm not going to hang my ankle in one coming off or, fall, or, or have that, that plastic covering have such a slick spot. You know, it's much better. But what I was doing was we had to compete with, with Vince, and we were calling his a cartoon character that had come to life. But we were the NWA. We were the real deal. We were the tough guys. And as a matter, matter of fact, I started out by calling us the real deal. And the Turner Broadcasting lawyers, these geniuses, said we couldn't use that term because they, because that was something a term of Andrew Holyfield used. Well, give me a break. But anyway, that's the kind of things you deal with. So, the, the then the other thing was that I eliminated and didn't eliminate. I made it a disqualification for somebody to come off the top rope on somebody. Oh my gosh, you're killed the business, and we don't see the big bumps. That's again the stupidest thing I ever heard because all in every place I'd ever run. It was a DQ to come off the top rope on a guy. There's where you got the heat by sneaking it. In other words, you distracted the referee, something happened, you came off the top rope, which was illegal, and you beat the guy. And, and Bill, let, let me interject that we've seen that they didn't eliminate the high flying because... No! And, and it has basically gone a long way towards killing much of the business today with all the injuries, uh, every move, people trying to top the move before... Uh, you know, and it's well. That's what I mean. Again, yeah. they're talking about guys who begin criticizing something in a very, very vicious way that they absolutely had no background to really be a true critic, other than the fact that they all of a sudden could write a sheet. And again, I have no problem with them writing the sheets and or having a difference of opinion with me. I have no. Problem. And the other thing is, I wouldn't tell them what I was doing. So we we always they mm. never could figure our angle. 
they never could figure our angle. I, they liked it at first, and then they didn't like it because hell, they like to, they want to know everything you're going to do before you do it. I always thought the fact that there wasn't much leaking from you during that time frame might have had something to do with the antagonism versus sure. versus earlier. Sure, because all of a sudden now they didn't have, they couldn't be the big shot. They could not be the big shot. They couldn't make it all about them, and that's where the antagonistic. Uh, aspect came in you know again it's no mystery at all i mean to me it's hilarious uh, the funny thing is when we when we made ron simmons the first black world's champion in a major wrestling promotion that was a tough tough town to get real emotion with i mean these are some of the toughest fans in america and yet when you looked around the ring they were crying there were people in the audience crying that's how much they bought what we did. That's old school. That's why I said the business, people think the business has changed. It's changed in the presentation, but it's never changed in what makes the business the business. It's still the same business. And for people to say, well, it's changed and you're behind the times. You know, it's so funny. I remember Sting said, well, you know, Bill, the business has changed a lot since you got it. I said, you're right. You guys used to get paid on what you drew. Now you get paid whether you draw any money or not. I said the next thing is, back in the old days, you sometimes the people believed in our business, so sometimes you had to fight your way to the ring and fight your way back from the ring. I said the guys today don't ever have to fight their way to the ring or back to the ring because nobody believes it. They all know it's fake because you guys have given it away. I said John Wayne didn't kill all the Indians in the movies he was in, but he didn't put his arm around them and ride off into the sunset. It's an illusion. People didn't believe the business was 100% on the level, even way back then. What they would say, yes, but that Dick Murdoch and that killer Carl Cox, they hate each other. They really, they bought into the angle. But if you put a camera on every person at ringside, they're not going to get up there and say, yes, I believe everything about pro wrestling is on the level. I mean, it was, you know, that just, just wasn't there. But they believe certain matches exceeded exceeded it. So, again, the, the business was given away, and the sheets now are in a position where they're dictating to the business, and they're also the inside sheet, and they have the right to start criticizing the angle before the angle even plays. Yeah. Well, they do have the right to criticize it. And yes, that doesn't, they do. It yes, doesn't mean I they're right or I've wrong. I've never argued with that. Yeah. What I'm saying is the animosity was they didn't know what we were doing, and they were criticizing things they didn't understand. Uh, the, the heat... Interest in a match. If you are a promotion and you allow the heat, hardcore heat for the sake of heat, what credibility do you really have as a promoter? I mean, in other words, if I okayed you walking out and intentionally blinding the junkyard dog, right in front of everybody, just flat walk up and blind him, then the next time, why don't I let you walk up and shoot him and kill him? What's the difference? The difference is there has to be some credibility where the promotion is not the shill for everything that happens, even though it is. When people talk about the psychology of the business, they tend to talk about it from an in-ring aspect, but you're talking about it from an out-of-ring aspect, just the, the setup of it. Well, I'm just talking about what, what, what the psychology of the business is, and, mm. and, and you paint the picture in the ring, but you get people's interest it's a soapbox. Wrestling is a giant living soapbox. And that's what attracts people to it. People live it. That's why they love professional wrestling so much, because it's their life. They either relate to their hero or they hate the villain or maybe their bosses are so mad at their boss. They get Whatever it is, there's so much emotion taken out. That's why shrinks and people have tried to analyze it and this and that and the other and it's it, it, it's just like what what draws you to 24 what draws you to the watch the unit 24 is a hot television show why because of the excitement you you know something's going to happen jack bauer is going to barely win the day today but then there's going to be another swerve or another curve that's what the wrestling business if you get the wrestling business where it's totally predictable where there's no mystery then really people don't. They, the, the diehards will stay with it because they'd stay with it no matter what, and that's great. But you lose something there. You lose the mystery. There needs to be a little mystery. That's you, all about the rest. So I put the mystery back in it. Mm. 
by the take, by the top rope situation. Never ever intended for the top rope not to be used. My gosh, if you'd ever watched any promotion I ever did, the top rope was always significant, but we made it illegal. The old concept about wrestling was if you were a villain and I was the baby face, you couldn't out-wrestle me, you couldn't out-fight me. You had to cheat to beat me. If you can beat me fair and square head-on, you ought to be the baby face. Yeah. That's the old concept. So the whole concept was to distract the referee. That's how the old manager started outside the ring. Distract the referee. Screw the baby face, who's such a better athlete, a better person. Screw him while the referee can't see it. That's what the wrestling concept was. That's what a heel does. If the heel can go out and out wrestle me and out fight me and right in front of me, he doesn't need to be the heel. He should be the hero. So we put the heel back in that had been taken out in that short time. But they didn't understand it. And so not understanding it because they'd never been around it, they really, all they'd been was these newbies that had these sheets. And again, I don't criticize anybody. They can write whatever they want. I never criticize them writing what they wanted. That, that's up to them. But then they started all the personal, they started the nepotism about me and my son. What a ridiculous thing. Who did I ever put him over that he couldn't beat anyway? Tell me that one. Well, I remember uh, the situation with Eric, and it seemed at the time they got very upset about that. They did. But, in lo- but Bill. Jim Ross wanted to push him faster than I was allowing him to be pushed. But Bill, in life, nepotism is part of life. I well, mean, hell it's, yes. It's, I had rather use somebody that has a background like the Funks. Like, look at the kids now, the second and third generation kids in it. But Eric, because of the sheets getting down on me, then they picked on that deal. But now go back to this thing, and who did I ever put Eric over that that wasn't at that same level or putting people over? You know, I didn't put him over anybody that he couldn't beat anyway, if it had been a shoot. And then it got all screwed up. Bill, Bill, who does Vince McMahon have today working under him? His wife? His I know, son no, I understand and his that. daughter. I, I just didn't That's understand. how fucked up it got when you get the sheets going crazy because it's something they, they want to do. And that's what happened. They wanted to dictate the business. And I with me, they weren't going to get to dictate it. The product in the ring. I remember at the time, it wasn't classic Mid-South Bill Watts. Did you feel like trying to modernize it with the names like Beach Blast and Halloween Havoc and some of those. Those, those, those were already established when I got there. But some of the videos they wanted you to do, did, that, did you feel was, like that I, when added? When Sharon Sadello did a $80,000 trailer to advertise a pay-per-view, I about fainted. I about friggin' fainted. They had, an alter, they had a casting call, but she, she was another one. I had to have her, and then next they wanted her to sit into my booking meetings. She had about as much reason to be in a booking meeting is I have to be on a zoo. I mean, it was just, that was the kind of shit that I was having to get strapped with that made no damn sense. She had no ability, no reason, but she's a vice president, and all of a sudden I've got to have her. So I did. I took her in, and I treated her really, really good. I don't care what anybody says. I treated her really, really good. But, I mean, that's some of the stupidity I had to deal with, that she could go have a casting call and spend 80000 stinking dollars on doing a trailer to pub to publicize a pay per view, when we have three or four or five hours of television anyway, that every one of them is a program link commercial. Why do you need when you're bleeding red ink and trying to get the red ink under control? Why do you need to spend eighty grand? I had no control over it. I'm telling you, there's so many things that I had no control over because Turner Broadcasting was so splintered. We had the worst production equipment. We should have had the best. We could have killed them. Turn, we Turner. should have had the best. I'm the one that wanted to put a show against Vince's show, and Ted would not let me, and Bill Shaw wouldn't let me. I wanted to run a Turner Broadcasting special every, against Vince every time he ran a pay-per-view because that was his livelihood with us. It was just another deal. They wouldn't let me the because the cable operators wouldn't let them. All the things they did later were things that I wanted to do. I thought it was amazing. All of a sudden now they've seen the light. Was, was was Ted Turner in the same physical building with you? Yeah, well, did you yeah, ever? We were on one tower, and he was in there. I kept trying to say, "Ted, I need to get with you." Did you ever like walk over and knock? I his... did. I said, "Ted, I need to get with you." He said, "Run it by Shaw." I said, "Hell, there, I was stuck because Shaw was the problem. Shaw was the problem, 
and Ted was isolated, and I couldn't get Ted to sit down because Ted, Ted and I had talked a jillion times clear back in the old days, and he's and Ted's a smart guy, and I'm I, and I and I wanted him to know what the hell was going on. It was just it was just ridiculous, and so finally it just got to the point. You know, it's somebody called me the other day. This is how stupid people get. Somebody called me the other day who's a big, big fan. He said, do you know I'm reading Zabisco's book? And I don't read anybody's book. Never have read anybody's book. Don't care to. But the bottom line, he said, is Zabisco was saying that you ran Flair off of WCW. He said, my gosh, you weren't even there. It's Heard that ran him off. I said, well, no kidding. I'm the one that got Flair back to WCW. And he said another thing. He said, Jim Ross was scared every day that you were going to fire him. I said, that, you know, poor Zabisco, I don't even know what he dreams that stuff. Jim Ross was my right-hand man at Mid-South. Jim Ross was my right-hand man at WCW. I've always trusted Jim Ross, and Jim Ross has always lived up to that trust. Jim Ross is a phenomenal. That's the reason I knew how stupid, in my opinion, Eric Bischoff was, and the first thing he did when he took over was fire Jim Ross, who had the best ability in the company. The best ability in the company. Well, Vince knew what Jim Ross's ability was. Look who's still an important guy in the business and who isn't. So that's that going you, on. as a human being or a businessman or what? No, no, because, I, you, again, in a corporate America environment, you're spending too much time taking the arrows out of your back. You need to have people circle the wagon and pull together. It didn't happen at Turnbrug. Like I said, we had the worst television equipment instead of the best. We were the no matter what, we were the show place of WTBS. If you check the station average ratings, wrestling always exceeded station average. The only time that the station had a show that beat wrestling was when the Turner uh, when uh, the, the Braves played in the World Series that one year. They they finally got some decent ratings, but wrestling that's what Ted Turner understood. He understood the power of the ratings in wrestling. And what, that's what the bean counters didn't understand. Was there a creative moment with the, with WCW that you created that finally everyone got out of the way and you were able to do what you wanted to do that you can look back with and say, that's what I wanted to do, that's what I wanted to do more of? Well, everything we did, everything we did worked. When I got there, I don't know if you remember, when I got there, the Omni was, was practically dark because... They let it go downhill so bad that it was not even being run. And I said, my gosh, this is our hometown. And we got the Omni back. We got the ratings back. Everything we did was successful. Again, remember, we turned the we turned an, uh, an $8 million a year loss into a $400,000 loss in eight months, in 11 months. So what we were doing was working. It did work. I knew it would work. There was no doubt in my mind that it was. I never doubted it. I mean, my gosh, it, it's just it's just back to basic, solid business. I remember the day that you quit, and I remember thinking, this is a dark day for wrestling because I knew what was going to come back was some corporate uh, type to run well, yeah, things. Yeah, they got a guy who wrote a game show. So Shaw thought, well, gosh, he wrote a game show. He's a genius. Anybody with Hollywood. I mean, when I got there, for instance, they, had pay, where they were paying Ventura for something like 400000 a pay-per-view or per pay-per-view to commentate. I thought, give me a break. Why in the hell would you need to pay anybody that kind of money? And then he wanted to do his own thing. Matter of fact, I set him down and said, I'm going to tell you something. If you don't start doing your commentary along the storylines that I'm building, you'll get your money because I can't stop that, but your ass will be sitting home in, 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 in friggin' Minnesota. And he got it, and so he started... He started with me before the show so he could start commentating along the direction of the lines that we wanted him to. But, I mean, he was, everybody was a, a, a cannon and using it for their own ends and their own means and, and to try to get this thing coordinated. Look at the deal Hulk Hogan made. You don't want to talk about what contributed a lot to the fact there's no wrestling anymore at Turner Broadcast. Look at the deal they gave him. How much a pay-per-view did he get to come back? I mean... And do I begrudge him? Hell no. He was a smart, smart guy. I mean, this guy could get the money out of him, and yep. that's what it's all about. I don't begrudge him getting the money, but, I mean, from a business perspective, 
That's insane. That now, is insane. Bill, you worked with uh, Eric Bischoff worked under you. What was your impression? Let me tell you about yeah. Eric Bischoff. Go ahead. Me, real quickly. No, take your Eric time. Eric Bischoff was a booth announcer, and he came crying to me because we weren't using him. And he hated Jim Ross. When I got there, his is one guy. I wanted to send him home. The problem was he had gotten there acting under one of those stupid contracts. They couldn't fire him then, or they had to pay the contract. All he was was a booth announcer. That's all he really was for Vern, as far as I understood. He had never been what anybody considered a really mainstream good commentator. So we said, well, I said, Jim, let's do this. we got to use the guy. We really have to use him. So we agreed to start using him and at least trying to get something out of him. In the meantime, all the stuff was going on again behind my back between Ole and Sharon Sadello. Ole was out of the business. I gave Ole a job there, trusted him. And he was sticking the knife in my back. And Sharon Sadello, I didn't he end up marrying her? You know, it just got to be such a zoo. And the good thing about it, I didn't have to have it. The only thing I felt bad about is I had I had people there who believed in what we were doing. Jim Ross had put his ass on the line. Flair was coming back. Matter of fact, I, t- I called Flair. I said, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Make any deal you want. They want you so bad you can make any damn deal you want. That's how bad they want you. Do whatever you need to do. Make your best deal. We had Jim Cornette coming. They crapped on that deal, one of the most talented guys in the business. I mean, so, you know, again, that's the only reason I hung on as long as I could. Then Bob Dew came in that one day, and Shaw was trying to, 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 to separate Dew and I, so he was telling Dew I was doing this and this and this behind Bob Dew's back. It just flabbergasted me. I think Shaw is one of the most treacherous people I've ever met, in my opinion. And, and, and so, you know, then, then Bob and I said, Bob, I've, I'm sick of this. I've had it. It's not being done the way I want it to be done, and I, I'm tired of fighting. You know, you just you couldn't fire the people you wanted to fire. And so it got to where it just got more and more ridiculous. I said, I quit. I'm going home. I said, I've had it. He said, are you really? I said, yeah, I'm done. He said, when? I said, today. I'm done today. And he said, well, let's go over and tell Shaw that you're leaving. I said, all right, we're going to go over there. So we get over there, and that's when Shaw said, springs the deal about the guy, what's his name from Pittsburgh, Madden or somebody about the deal he wrote to Hank Aaron that I was a racist. And I died laughing. I said, Shaw, you know, you're such a phony SOB. That was all covered before you all ever even hired me. But it makes absolutely no difference today. He said, why? I said, I've already quit. The only reason I've come over here is to tell, is Bob wanted me to come tell you, I've quit. I'm going home. I'm done. All I want is my severance pay. I want seven weeks. And I also want you to pay my moving fee back to Oklahoma. And they agreed to everything and did it all. I got Here's when people start saying I got fired. I had got seven weeks segments pay. The cost to move me back to Oklahoma cost me either 20 or 25 grand. I can't remember which. Does that sound like I got fired for cause? No. Or, no. So that's what happened. And Bob do is like, Bob do is like somebody stole his candy because he had this whole thing worked up in his mind over this letter from this guy at Pittsburgh who was another Jack off sheet writer. The, the difference is, in the old days, you could have walked in and slapped them, and today they hide behind their newspaper and they threaten to sue you. See, so they don't have any responsibility for running their mouth. I kind of like the old days where you had to stand up and be counted for what you said. But the bottom line is, they'd written that to Hank Aaron, and then Hank had done his deal because he was the token on the Turner board. And so, you know, they did all, the, and Shaw could just see, oh man, I've finally got Watts where I wanted. He didn't have anywhere he wanted. We'd already gone over all that. But he was trying to resurrect it because he probably didn't go over what we'd gone over with Turner. So he was going to use it with Ted. Who knows what he was going to do? But the bottom line, when, when, when Shaw said, Bill's, the only reason Bill's here is to tell you he's quitting, he's going home. You know, he's quit. He's out of here. Yeah. I, I think it's pretty well accepted, Bill, that you did quit. Do you, do you think that you could have stayed? Or I don't even know and don't care. I didn't <laughs> okay. want to. I go where I want to when I want to. Okay. You know, I mean, see, I'm a leader, not a follower. That's what a lot of people don't get. That's why I'm such a lightning rod. I had somebody ask me the other day, says, well, when you change a deal, would you go ask your talent if they agreed with it? I said, are you out of your mind? Why would I go ask my talent if they agreed with the direction I was going to go? Who the hell do you think was running my business? You know, if I asked, if I had to go ask my talent about every move I made, I'd have been out of business years ago. 
That doesn't even make sense. So I've always gone and I've done what I want to do when I want to do it because I'm the one paying the bills. I'm the one responsible. It, the buck stops at the top. I've always believed in that. <laughs> it's not at the bottom. You set the culture from the top. You don't set the culture from the bottom. Were you stunned when Eric Bischoff was named to uh, take over? No, I don't think I had any reaction because I, you know, I, I don't think I cared and I didn't have any reaction. You know one thing about me when I leave? I don't watch wrestling today. Why would I? You're, well, you're not the only one. Well, I know, but I mean, people say, to you, no, you know why I don't? Because why would I frustrate myself? Because if I watched, I couldn't watch it unless I had the eye toward how I would have changed this or that mm. or what I'd do. So I don't watch it because there's no reason for me to watch it. And, and, and so I, now I did watch, again, Shawn Michaels and Taker's match at WrestleMania and enjoyed, and I watched Ricky Steamboat's match. Enjoyed the devil out of Ricky Steamboat's match. I was amazed because I thought he, you know, this guy went out there and did a hell of a match. And, 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 you know, I mean, to walk back in there and see Ricky Steamboat to me was always a class guy. I loved to have him on my cards because I always knew the caliber of the match I was going to get. Some guys you wanted on the cards because you knew that there would be a caliber of the match that spoke to the good side of the business. That's a Ricky Steamboat. That's a Ted DiBiase who will always make the match or beyond their own whatever it took. They would do whatever it took. They would get the match over. Those were the kind of guys that you had to have. Uh, I used to book uh, Danny Hodge and Tony Charles in Florida and, and send them Broadway because those two guys would get a standing ovation in a clean babyface match because of the moves they made were so fantastic. So that was a great match for the business. And that's the same kind of thing with the Steamboat. So I was so proud of Steamboat for, for what he did at WrestleMania. I enjoyed the other match. I also saw that the matches following Taker and Sean couldn't follow him. Could not fall, and that's a shame, because when you say, "Well, they saw the match, they want that." No, 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 no. I'd rather follow a hot match. If I've got my stuff and I know what I'm doing, and I and I'm out there carrying the load, you want each match to be. You want to follow a hot match. You want to follow a good one. And for you to say, "Well, you couldn't follow it because they shot their wide on that match," that's just your own excuse because you can't deliver. You can't deliver. Yeah. You got back into the business in nineteen. 19- 95 with Vince, short term. Three months. Three, three. We did a three-month deal. That must have been, you must have thought a lot before accepting that because. No, the, I was curious. I okay. want, you know, I met him as a kid. I could see his genius, and I, and I, I had no intention of staying there. And he, he was playing his game with me, which was good because he's quite a gamesman. But I wanted to see what he, who he was as a person in the business, and I enjoyed the crap out of him. He, uh, he is extremely, extremely talented. It has nothing to do with whether I believe what he does or how he does it. That has nothing to do with it. The guy is a talented, talented guy. We could book ex- excellently together. We booked great together because he's a far-ranging visionary just like I am. So it was really easy to book with him. And, and his, his deal for me was Vince is so hands-on, he wants to do it all. So if you're working there in the creative aspect, you have to sit around and wait for him because he's got so much on his plate. And then we go to his home on the weekend. Would treat his wife would treat us first class. He'd have his chef out there. It was first class. Then he's interrupted every phone call. So I started stopping that. I started saying, Vince, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm out here to work, not to live. You know, I gotta have. A, I got a life. And I said, so when we come out here, I want to work, and I want you to shut the phones down and let's do the work. And I mean, I would challenge him on so many fronts. I'm gonna say this. You can imagine that because we know he's got a huge ego. Hell, so do I. But I'm going to say this. He accepted everything I said with such a great faith. And, and, and we had several confrontations. And then I did another thing with him when I said, Vince, when you come to television, you're so busy dealing with all the problems with your talent. You're here as talent. We need you to be at the show like the talent you are. And let's get the problems out of your hands until we get the television show put to bed. And so I said, I want to take over the entire TV show. I want you to be talent and do the thing you do best while you're here and handle wrestlers' problems another time. And he did it. And we did a couple of shows like that. We were coming back, I think it was by Chicago or somewhere. 
He pulled the car. He and I were riding together. He pulled the car off the side of the road and said, get out of the car. I didn't know what the hell he was going to do. I thought, what does he want to do, race or foot race or something? And He said, give me a hug. He said, I have never seen television like that in my life. It was just awesome. And so we clicked. We clicked. But then, too, it interfered with how he has to be in that he has to be doing it all. And he, and he, so he called me in and said, we got a problem, Billy. He said, I just have to be hands-on. I, I have to be hands-on. And I said, I understand that. We don't have any problem. He said, why? I said, it's simple. This is your place. There's not a room for two Titans at Titan. I'm going home. My, you know, my three months is up anyway. I don't want to move back here. I don't want to stay back here. And I said, I'm not going to sit around and wait on you to be through with everything so I can work. I have more of I, my life. I don't want to be a zombie in the wrestling business. But I respect you. I'm so glad for the time. And so I'm out of here. And he said, and no problem? I said, no. No problem. And he hugged me. And that's how we parted. That's how we parted. Well. Bill, I, I think that was another dark day for the business because I think if you look back at it, you could have you could have been a big help to the WWE. Well, and you know who knew that, and I hope I'm not speaking out of school. Was his wife? She saw that I was taking a load off of him, and she, you know, I was no threat, and he didn't think I was a threat. That's not it. She saw that I was taking a load off of that I was, and see, but who who felt threatened were the guys like Bruce Pritchard and people like that because they liked it the old way. But what was really happening there was the fact that, 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 that it would have made them have a better life because they would have not been slaves. And, they, and I don't mean slaves in a bad way. That's the way they've chosen to be. But I just didn't choose to be a slave. So people, some people knew it. But I, I didn't felt that Vince and I parted on a ba- bad way. He was very, very gracious to me. He was very busy. We didn't we didn't go hobnob or a bunch of stuff at WrestleMania, but he was certainly gracious to me. We said hello, and we had we shared a few pleasantries, and I thanked him, and I even shared a, a reflection with him that, that was so interesting. In that, I said, "Do you realize that in the days of the old garden for your dad, a sellout was about a sixty thousand dollar gate? So if you were the main event, you made twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five hundred." I said, you have paid me more today to come be inducted and have a great time here at the hall. You paid me more than I made as the main event for your dad. And he got a, I said, I just thought you might get a kick out of that. And he smiled. He said, I hadn't thought about it like that. So Vince is a, he, he is such an intense businessman. I have no problem with that or how he conducts his business. Again, my only problem was that I, I, it wasn't a place for me. I knew then that the things that, there's certain things about the wrestling business that I'm so drawn to that I don't want to be around. It just, they're just, I can't get around the wrestling business. All my language goes back to four letter words. It's just, just how, how I talk, which again, that's another point. So the sheets and everybody misunderstood, or even Shaw and them. Gosh, oh my, do you cuss your wrestlers? I didn't cuss my wrestlers. Do you think that I could get away with cussing a Danny Hodge or a Dr. Death Steve Williams if I was cussing them? Or Hacksaw Duggan? I mean, Hacksaw Duggan is about as tough and he's got about as quick a fuse as anybody I know. I was more like a Lombardi or a Ditka in that I had such a passion for the business when I was correcting and teaching them. I used the vocabulary of the heat of the passion, which is the only thing I know. And so I used a lot of cuss words, but I didn't say use it. I didn't make it personal to them. Nobody could get away with that, not me or anybody else. So the the difference was that my guys understood what I was doing, and they didn't. It wasn't that I I wasn't downgrading them personally. It's just the way, and I and I got tick, so tickled with Turner Broadcasting, and I said, "No, you guys want an agent to do the talk." And I said, "That's like Deion Sanders, who was playing for Atlanta. Then every time he gets mad, he goes home, and y'all talk to his agents and give him a raise. How stupid is that? Make him live up to his contract." He's got a contract. Well, that's what's happened in sports. They sign a new contract, and all of a sudden, the next day, they're no longer happy with the new contract they just signed. How the hell do you run a business when you want to change the deal on me that we just negotiated the day before? Well, you don't. Well, that's what's happened in the take, sports world well, today. Well, take a look at America in general today. <laughs> Again, thank you. So I'm just, yeah, I'm old school in that if you're dealing with me, first of all, you know exactly where you stand. 
There is no secret. I'm not, I'm not a guy that builds intrigue around you. You know, right where you, I'm right in your face. I'll answer your questions, and you can do it my way or the highway. Because there has to be somebody take personal responsibility for what's going on. And all I ever wanted any of the wrestlers to be was accountable, too. I wanted them to also be accountable. If there is no accountability, how do you run a business? If you took the Mid-South product that you had from 1980 to 1983 and magically were able to put it back on TV today with the same talent, do you think people would be interested in it today? Boy, that's a tough, 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 tough question. You know, the problem is they've been re-educated. No matter what, they have been re-educated. I don't think you can go backwards. I was even going to do something similar to w, uh, to UFC and franchise cities with it and do that and, and create teams, wrestling teams. And then I thought, my gosh, it would take so much to educate the public to what I was doing. And, and so, you know, I just didn't think that I had the desire to, to get in the trenches that much. So in your, that's a good question you're asking. And, and really, I don't think it's a unique question. I think a lot of people wonder about that. But I think it's, a, it's, a, it's such an education factor now because they, no matter what, the business has not stopped. It's gone forward. And so this is the business now. So, I, uh, yeah, I think there's a place for it because we prove that the people still react to the same emotion. They've always reacted to the same emotion. Well, but the, but how, would you get the, how would you get the culture? How would you get the culture established? How much money would it take? Well, Bill, the thing is, football is basically the same game on the field it was 20 or 30 years ago, a little different maybe. but No, 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 it isn't. That, see, that again, now you're like a sheep guy. The football is not the same game. On the field? No, not even close. Okay, go ahead. Tell all me. All right, let's go some difference. Okay, go ahead. First of all, when I played football, if you were an offensive lineman, you had to keep your hands into your pads. Today, it's legalized holding. Okay. Huge, huge difference in just that structure alone. The other thing is, is all these rules changes. I mean, I, I can't go through each one, but there's been tremendous rule changes. I remember, let's take NBA basketball. Okay. It got such terrible ratings, I used to wonder how it stayed on television. They were chicken track ratings, so it was, a, it was considered an ethnic sport. The only thing that kept it on TV back then was it was – because it was considered an ethnic sport. I'm telling you, that's the truth, because I was competing against it. Well, what did the NBA do? The NBA did the smart thing. They go and they put the 30-second shot clock in, and they, then they, do you get any more, do you get any more points for slam, and, slam dunking? No, but it's a lot more exciting, isn't it? Better but run the biggest the, thing is they yep. changed the rules. They've changed so many of the rules in the NBA to create the excitement. What did baseball do? It brought the fences in closer, it changed the height of the pitcher's mound, and it tightened the strike zone. Why? To make it a hitter's game. Those games are not the same as it was on the field. Not, no, no, no. No, no, no. They may all put on pads. Even the pads aren't the same. The pads are so much better. But it's not even close to being the same game that it used to be on the field. That's a misnomer. So every, every sport has, has evolutionized. Amateur wrestling is the one that sucks the most because they have made it an elitist sport that nobody wants to watch. That's why so few schools have amateur wrestling. In the Big 12, you only have five colleges that have amateur wrestling. And amateur wrestling as a spectator sport is sucks <laughs> yeah. because the officials have taken it over and they've taken the wrestler out of it. The officials could start saying, you're stalling. If you're on top of the guy and riding too good, they get you for stalling. If you're on top of the guy and putting in a pinning combination, they get you for potentially dangerous. You're screwed either way. So that's what they've done to amateur wrestling. That's why it's dying. Hang on a minute. I'm sorry. No problem. Hang on, turn it there. No problem. Boomer Center is probably Bob Stoops calling me to get my to, to tell him what to do next year and, and at OU. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Yeah, I know. Bill, you're so you're arguing that <laughs> football, basketball, baseball have more evolved. more more have evolved. Okay, it's, and, it's, you're arguing that they're more entertaining. Okay. Yes. Now let's take it back to wrestling. Do you think the wrestling product is more entertaining? 
I think there's more bells and whistles. Uh, I don't think it's any. I don't think it's. I don't know. I see. I don't watch it, so I really don't know. I, I the bells and whistles uh, they've got are amazing. Uh, you know the entrances and all that stuff. I think that all adds to the show. Uh, you know the, 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 the there's no there's not even a there's not even any any semblance of realism. Uh, you know. It, I mean. It, you know. What I'm amazed at, to tell you the truth, is that how the choreographing has become so advanced that 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 a match, every single move is choreographed. That's why, again, Michaels and Undertaker stole the show. They could work old school. See, we might lay out a few spots with ourselves, and we used them if we needed them, or we might not use them. I was amazed when I was working for Vince that a couple of top stars were late getting to the TV. They only had an hour before they went, were on the TV, and they couldn't work out a 10-minute match. I was using for an example one time. We had just broken open Jackson, Mississippi, so I was going in there first time against Gary Hart and the spoiler. There was horrible weather. I had to keep changing planes because that's before I had my own because they kept... Uh, they kept canceling flights, so pretty soon I'm stuck in Memphis trying to get the street to Jackson, Mississippi. I called my partner, the promoter, and I said, you know, I can't make it. They've canceled this flight. He said, my God, Bill, you've got to make it. We are sold out. This was the first sellout in the history of Jackson. I mean, it was packed. He said, we're sold out. He said, this place is going nuts. You have to be there. I went and chartered a single-engine Bonanza and flew through a tornado watch at night which you can't do anymore. That's illegal. In order to make the damn show, that's how, how, in order to make the show, that's the danger I went through. Was it smart? No. I did it. And, of course, I, could, I was a pilot, and this guy was a pilot. When I got there, it was almost midnight. The police were at the airport. They picked me up. I changed clothes in the car. I, they, had, they had done the card over and over every way they could figure to do it. And at the stall, the people were still there. The place was still going crazy. I went in there, and I told him, I said, tell Gary Hart to make an extra blade and that we'll do the two out of three fall thing and we'll do a double DQ, tear the mask, double blood. That's all we got to talk. And we went out there, and I let me tell you something. First of all, let me tell you real quick. I have never said to anybody that I was a good worker or a great worker. I was not. I understood what I could do and what I couldn't do. But we went out there and tore the joint down, and we had a fantastic match, three falls, and the crowd was going, without having one moment that we got to talk to each other in the dressing room. That's what I'm saying. I don't know what these guys today would do. A Shawn Michaels and Undertaker, they could do it. And, I, and I'm sure there's other guys. Ric Flair could do it. There's other guys that could do it. But the, where the business is today... Because Ricky Steamboat sat there and talked to me about his match at WrestleMania and described every single move he had to make. And I said, Ricky, you're, you're making me tired. Good gosh almighty. He said, Bill, that's where the business is today. Every single move is choreographed. Uh. That, see, is some. I'll never forget when I was at WCW, I laid out a simple finish. And Mike Graham stopped me. He said, Bill. Can I tell you something? I said, what, Mike? Because I had great respect for Mike. He said, Bill, these guys cannot do that. I said, oh, bullshit, Mike. That's a simple-ass finish. He said, Bill, they can't do it. They cannot. These guys can't do that. I said, bullshit. Yes, they're going to do it. They went out and screwed it all up. I apologized to Mike when they came out of the ring. I said, you're right, they can't. From now on, help me tone them down. Help me tone them down. Because unless they were from the old school... They couldn't do it. They could not do a complicated finish. Well, you can choreograph it, and but again, the great workers of, of their day, yeah, you would say, okay, here's a couple of spots if we need them. The spots were if we need them, but they weren't spots that we had to do. We don't have to do them because we can carry the load, and so they were spots that you had if you if something came up or didn't come up. And sometimes guys would go out there and may not even talk spots. They could talk them in the ring, and yeah. nobody knew they were talking. 
That's how the business has changed. But the, still, the emotion that drives the business has not changed. Bill, in 92, if Turner had kept his corporate people out of your hair, allowed you to do whatever you wanted to do, as they had originally agreed, mm-hmm. do you think Vince would be in business today? Oh, you know, I think we could have put a real hurting on him because we had the things he didn't. First of all, we had Turner controlled the cable operators. And if we'd have put things against him, we could have really bled his ratings and stuff like that. We could have done a lot of things. Now then, I think it's kind of like war today. You go to war with a great game plan, and then everything comes apart because the enemy adjusts too. And I don't care what, you know, I could say this, this, or this, but Vince McMahon is is extremely, extremely sharp. Extremely sharp. But he didn't own a TV network, and that that was a big uh, card that uh, Turner had. Well, that's what I mean. We should have been able to. We should have been able to. I thought we could. But again, you, I don't care what. Your plan is a constantly one that has to constantly evolve. And, and and he's still not going to roll over for you. But, you know, I, again, going back to fact, he told me later that had Wrestling Mania 1 not hit, that he was bankrupt. That's how close he was to bankrupt then. So there's lots of things that, that, that could affect, but I can't say without a doubt because we didn't get to do it. I thought we could, I thought we could put him out of business. I thought we could. I thought we had the product. I thought we had... You know, with Turner, but like I said, that's what amazed me. They'd give us the shitty uh, equipment. We never had the top of the line equipment. We were like a stepchild there. See the the, the 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 bean counters and the and the execs. They wanted to replace wrestling with a movie package for years because they didn't understand the the the, the impact of it to the station with people, the emotion of it, and the fact that. They didn't understand the business. They just did not understand it. I mean, they didn't have a movie package that ever got those ratings. Bill, when you see the country in the toilet today financially, and we and we are, oh, do, yeah. you, do you go back to 1992 and your corporate experience and tie the two together and say, that's it? These corporations, the mindset, the lack of hard work has brought us to this point, or do you think it's bigger than that? I think the corruption in Washington, D.C., and in politics is so out of control that I don't know that it can ever get that ship righted. And let me say real quickly, I am not against Obama because of his race. Not at all. I'm against Obama because of his political philosophy. I think that, and uh, and I think the liberals have, have captured the media. I think they're elitists, they're theorists. And they, and you know they're doing things that are ludicrous. They're doing they're doing things that just do not make sense. They're having they're trying to make retroactive punishment and penalties. I mean it's insane. They want to spend time going back and trying to to destroy or try to uh, make Bush and Cheney and those guys be on trial for the things they didn't know. I mean it's just insane. Our rules of engagement. I mean all of it's insane. It doesn't make sense. I mean you know when you start. They're throwing the Constitution under the bus. They're throwing the rule of law under the bus. When you can extort from executives who got bonuses by contract, whether the whether the contracts were smart or not, when you can extort and threaten them so bad they give the money back because they're afraid for their own safety, and you're also going to pass legislation to tax all the money after the fact, that is just big government extortion, and it's scary and it's out of control. And I don't know that people see it yet. A lot of people, a lot of your conservatives do see it, but a lot of people are buying that. The have-nots, they don't care. They just want something that's free. Well, in, in fairness, Bill, George Bush, Hank Paulson, put through the first bailouts. Oh, no, I did, you, well, George Bush, I didn't say one party. I, okay. said, I, I, said, I said the corruption in Washington. Yes, they did. That first bailout, they sure did. And how did you feel? I, I know how I felt about I, it. I have not been a, a fan of George Bush's. For some time, I voted for him twice because I would I, I thought he was less of an evil than the guys who were running against him. But the bottom line is, I thought George Bush as a leader, I thought he was horrible. Mm. But I don't think that any president can really affect it. I think the corruption in Washington is layered so deep. You know, the lobbyists, the money, the, the stupid legislation, and big government, I don't care what, big government is growing by leaps and bounds, and it's scary. They're... They they are taking over, 
And people don't realize they're taking our freedoms away just about as fast as you can possibly take them away. And so I, am I concerned? You bet I'm concerned. But I don't think there's anything I can do about it. I, don't, I, think, it's, I think it's out of control. I think it is out of control. Well, yesterday, of course, they announced that Medicare and Social Security are going broke much quicker than expected, and I'm sure that a year from now there'll be a similar announcement. And uh, it's it's kind of scary. Do you think that, uh, that. Do, you, do you think things can turn around? I'm not optimistic no, that I things can turn around. See you see, isn't it funny how they try to spin it that the worst of the recession is over? Yeah, the last three months have been beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I mean, can you? T- I mean, my gosh, all I see on the headlines are. This company's laying off more. That company's laying off more. I don't see anything that makes me think the worst of it's over. I don't see anything that, that where companies are expanding again or putting on more workers. <laughs> and I don't believe the... I think there was a, a reason and a need for unions at one point. I think the unions got too strong, and Obama's going to pay back the unions, and he thinks the answer is to let the unions have more power and to have a, and to have a the, the ability now to go back and have uh, and not allow a secret ballot where then they can retaliate against anybody that votes against them? Where are unions the answer? How do we buy a car company? How do you fire, as a president of the country, how do you fire the head of General Motors? That's none of your damn business. That is none of your damn business. That is government extortion. Bill, Bill, would you have just, again, in fairness, the government had put money into General Would you have just let General Motors fail? Let me tell you, it's against the Constitution for the government to own a private business, okay. first of all. And the next thing is, I would have let, I would have let the market work its way through. Here's what happens: General Motors is not going to fail; they're going to restructure. But they can't restructure if you don't let them get to the point where they have to restructure, because they've not offered one damn thing that's any better than what they've been doing. All the guys in power, I, I realize the guys in power got to go, but the president of the United States has no right to fire a CEO of a private health company. Isn't it amazing that during the oil crisis, how they made Big Oil the villain? Because they were making a 4% profit per gallon, they never did get on to the fact that the government is taxing us federally 15% a gallon, did they? They never offered to lower the federal income, uh, the federal tax on the on gasoline, did they? Do they? Did you see them getting on Bill Gates for exorbitant profits? Do you think Bill Gates may make a little more than 4% on the software he sells? But you see what they do. The government does this. They do it so well. It's called distraction. They distract you from the real deal. And while you're distracted, they're screwing. Just about those bonuses that the executives gave you back, what were they, $165 million? Yeah. They didn't say anything about the $35 billion of the bailout that went to foreign banks in Europe, did they? That propped up Merrill Lynch and, 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 and Sachs and Goldman, did they? No. But they made private citizens who had contracts become villains and attacked them in the most brutal way, threatening their very security. They, they had the, the Attorney General of New York and the Attorney General of, where was it, Connecticut or somewhere. And I'll tell you what, Glenn Beck, who's doing a hell of a job, he had the guy on and he said, let me ask you this, what right do you have? What law? And the guy said, they didn't earn it. Oh, that, well, then why should we have to pay A-Rod in New York? He didn't earn it last year either. What good is a contract if all of a sudden you say, I didn't earn it? But they have no law, and yet they were going to go after these guys with criminal prosecution, and they kept, it, they kept and they were going to release their names and addresses to the public. Look at this Acorn deal. These are thugs. They have their equivalent of Hitler's brown coats out there, that if you get on Acorn too much, they'll show up at your house. I mean, they have criminals in this thing. They're going to let them run the census. You talk about corruption, and you're right. <coughs> the Republicans are right there in it too. Okay, and I want to ask you this: How about the America? How about how about the American people, Bill? Work ethic. Do you, is it like it was when you were growing up in America? Oh, I think America is still pretty solid. I think I think the culture is getting changed. Uh, I think uh, most Americans are good, honest people. I think they're confused. I think they're easily swayed. I, because first of all, in our education system, they don't even teach much much real solid history. That's all being kind of rewritten. It's kind of like certain halls of fame, isn't it? They can rewrite history. 
But the bottom line is, I think the basic American people are still a pretty good people, but who do you trust? Who do you know? I mean, basically speaking, the guys at General Motors says, you know, listen, if the government would just finally make one clear-cut decision over what we're going to have to deal with as far as what we produce, we could have pulled ourselves out. But the government keeps changing the playing field. I mean, Barney Franks, Bush knew that the, 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 the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were in trouble, and he tried to introduce stuff on it. Who blocked it? Carl Dodd and Barney Franks. Then on the, on the bailout, uh, the Obama administration had Dodd do protective, protective policy bills attached to it to protect the guys on the bonuses until the bonuses became a hot issue, then they threw them under the bus, just like he threw everybody else under the bus. It's just politics as usual. It's called distraction. It's the politics of distraction. And that's what's happening to our country. Who's still talking about the border problem in Mexico? Nobody. Why? Because it's, they've got it off the table now. They don't, they don't fix anything. The only thing they fix is making sure they have more power and, and they can rake more money in. And that's what's happened. Our government is so totally corrupt. You know, you wonder why all the allies don't embrace us. Which ally have we not double-crossed over, over the last few years? Bush, number one, double-crossed the people of Iraq when he pulled out the first time when he should have finished it off then, and, and then he let Saddam come back into power and go down and kill all the Kurds and the people that, are ridden, that we encouraged to rise up against him. So the fact that people say, well, gee, why didn't they embrace us as heroes? Are you kidding? Would you if you'd lived down there? Because you'd say, when are they going to pull out and leave us here and screw us again? So, again, it's, it's, it's the politics. I don't think all the people in Germany hated all Jews. It's the leadership. And it's our leadership that's all corrupt. And it's the system that's gotten so corrupt. And I just don't see, I don't see that anything's going to change. I mean, you know, and I've lived through a lot of it, so I've seen a lot. I'm 70 now. So I've seen a lot of the things that have gone on in America. And, and, and so I, I just don't have much faith. I've never thought, I've always thought politicians, how do you tell when they're lying? It's when their mouth is moving. I mean, you know, it's just, it, you know, I, I just, it's just, it, they, they make their deal by taking our money and taxing us for it and spending it. I mean, it, it, the tax code doesn't make sense. It's so complicated, nobody can do it. But they're not going to simplify it. There's too many people making money off of it. So I just don't see anything that's going to be done, and, and it's going to be done right. But why would you ever want the government to run health care? If we get government health care, the people in Canada won't have anywhere to go to get their real their real health care. Yeah. I mean, that's how bad it is. Well, but, like I said yesterday, they announced Medicare is going bankrupt. So what are we going to do? We're going to insure the rest of America as well. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it, it just, again, it's the politics of distraction. They'll They'll run the little whistle by you. And they'll pay, give you all the bells and whistles to cover up what they're really doing. But what they're really doing, they're screwing you. They are screwing you, and they're taking it right to you, and, and, and they're laughing all the way to the bank. And the bad thing is, America's in dire straits in these wars, and with this enemy. And we Stop and think this. The, the perverse genius of it, they've all of a sudden defined waterboarding as torture. My gosh, I went through worse than that at the Oak Club initiation when I was playing football at OU. I went through something ten times worse than waterboarding. There was just a hazing to get in the OU Athletic Club, and the coaches were there and, the, and the counselors were there watching it. Waterboarding used to be a, a hazing at VMI. Waterboarding is not torture, but they defined it as torture. Even I heard one of those liberals when somebody said, but your own people have written the fact that it worked. doesn't make any difference that it worked. It's illegal. Well, here, you want to know how I feel? If you can save one American life, and I don't mean by waterboarding. My deal would be hook the, it, it, make sure his balls are wet and hook one electrode to the left nut and one to the right nut and kick the voltage in. And for John McCain to get up there trying to suck off and straddle the fence and say, we have to, we ha torture doesn't work. It never, I'm going to tell you, have you forgot World War II when somebody in the resistance would get captured? They had less than four hours to get everybody out of there because they knew they could stop it, would break them, and the guy would tell everything? I mean, come on. Well, sure you're going to tell them a lie. Do you think you're the only guy they're interrogating? You think they're not going to interpolate it? The matter of fact is, the guy wouldn't tell us anything. They waterboarded him. He, he blew the whistle on everybody. It saved the attack in L.A. It got the other guy. 
all that over waterboarding. And we got people out there that are so stupid, they want to say, we can't do that. That's torture in America. It doesn't torture. My gosh, you call waterboarding torture? Your life is not at stake. It just makes you feel uncomfortable. That's what's happened to us. But our enemy is not held. Uh, McCain said, we got to honor the Geneva Convention to protect our soldiers in the field. Well, tell me one enemy, including World War II, that's ever honored the Geneva Convention. We're the only ones that ever honored it. I don't know where they get this logic. To me, if you go in a fight or a war, it's who gets there the first with the most. You fight to win. You fight to win. And I think that's what America's lost. Our politicians, we didn't lose a battle in Vietnam. We lost the battle in, in the public and in, in politics in Washington. Do we, should we have been there? Hell no. We shouldn't even have been there. I question that we should be in Iraq. And I don't understand now why we're still in Afghanistan. Who cares what they go back to? Isn't it funny we have this drug war that's not working that we spend all these millions and billions on, and we got our soldiers protecting the poppy fields in Afghanistan? Tell me how that works. Hey, Bill, uh, you've got no argument from me. Oh, I'm, yeah. Well, see, I get a little excited. You're right. I, I mean, when I see what's happening, it scares me. For our, I've seen the fabric of our nation go down, but I still think the American people as a whole are good and honest and willing to work. As a whole means more than 51%. Yeah, but it didn't make, you know, a lot of people don't study. And, and you know, a lot of people, this is my, you got to realize, is, let go me ahead. tell you something quick yeah, about yeah, wrestling. Yeah. Let's go back to wrestling. I have seen guys that couldn't work, couldn't do a crapping thing, that had what they call the office hole for one reason or another where they got put over on television every week, and the people told how great they were till the people finally started believing it. Well, so if you've got a liberal media that is always given the literal, liberal spew and who does not present both sides of the story, the masses, no matter what, are going to believe that. Now, if you look at Fox Network, which they now say Fox did these tea parties, Fox didn't organize those tea parties, and then the, the, the arrogance of the media covering them that was insulting people for being and calling it racism. It wasn't racism. There were Democrats. There were Republicans. There was Libertarians. There were people of all races there. It wasn't anti-Obama. It's anti-government spending. But the bottom line, you keep this thing going, and that's what the people believe is happening because that's all they hear. That's all they hear is they, they hear this liberal spin. So Fox at least gives another side to it. But now let's give you a comparison. Because O'Reilly's always telling I'm the number one show in cable television in prime time, The Factor. But then go and compare the ratings for, the, for that number one show, which, by the way, Fox has on their, on their other network. They have American Idol and one other show that outrate that, too. So we're talking about Fox Network News, which O'Reilly's on. But then go compare those ratings, and they do not beat even CBS, NBC, or ABC by themselves. Any one of those major three networks' news beats O'Reilly. Now combine them, and they're totally liberal, and O'Reilly's a drop in the bucket. And that's about the only place, other than talk radio, that you're going to get to hear the conservative side. And they're trying to figure a way to shut that down with this new going back to this truth in fairness broadcast. Yeah, they, yeah. So again, that's what that's how bad it is. Is that is nobody is getting to hear the truth. Well, and you make a good point, Bill. If you add up the ratings of all the conservative programs, they do not even come close to matching no, the no, no, they, they, to, no. to matching the nonsense. Which leads me to the conclusion, and you can disagree that it's not fifty-one percent in the country anymore and that the media and the political parties have influenced the people. And I don't know if we would win World War II today. Uh, if we I don't had... know if we'd have the will. You're right. The next thing is, 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 is uh... <sighs> yeah, yeah, no. You're, you're, you're so right about it. it, it it's a scary, scary situation. It just, it just fractures you when you start to see what's happening uh, uh, to, the, to the country and how the people are getting to, getting to swallow the Kool-Aid. And they're thinking short-sighted. And they're not studying history. Because history would reveal all. That's why you have history, so you don't repeat the same mistakes. But we've taken the history out of the, out of the school books. You can't even teach it. 
See, Bill, Bill, I th- don't think the problem was you in corporate America. I think the problem was corporate America with you. I think corporate America needs more people like you. And that's the problem is that it's gotten to the point now where everybody's covering for themselves and stabbing, like you said, stabbing each other in the back. And hard work, uh, the bottom line, those things are forgotten. And I think we're paying the price. And that's really why I wanted to talk to you for the past 90 minutes. And I really, really appreciate it, Bill. Let, let, me, let me just say uh, uh, one more thing. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I, I've said enough. You're, you're, you're right. It's, 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 you remember when America was born. They took great pride in being so open and speaking their mind, even in their humor. They were known to be saying things the way they believe. We have now gotten into this thing that the, that the elitists have sold us on another deal, where it's not politically correct to say something. We get guys fired for saying the truth. I remember a guy getting a, a commentator got fired because he made a comment about blacks being better athletes. Well, I want to just tell you something. They are. They are better athletes. And he got fired for it. But it's the truth. They are better athletes. I mean, give me a sport that's not black dominated. Well, NBC did a special one year, maybe 15 years ago, and they analyzed uh, the black athlete versus the white athlete. And I remember that Arthur Ashe was alive at the time, and they asked him. And he said that there was a difference. But, of course, he could say it. Well, yeah, and Ernie Ladd always said that, and he always told me why, and it was amazing. We had some great talks, but we have now made it where it's incorrect, and you can get fired if you say the truth, even because if it's if it's not politically correct, we have we can't comment. We're we're not we're not having a class of people that has been proven in America that they don't approve of, and we're going into a whole new marriage situation. <sighs> And I mean, and and yet, if you say anything about it, it becomes a hate crime. I remember Jim Barnett once told my kids I was that Bill is homophobic. I said, Jim, I'm not homophobic. Homophobic means I'm afraid of you being gay. I'm not afraid of you being gay. I just don't approve of your lifestyle. You're my partner, but I don't have to approve of your lifestyle. I can respect you as a businessman. I certainly do. But I don't approve of your lifestyle, and if you ever tell my kids I'm homophobic again, then you and I will have a problem. But I didn't, you know, again, I, his lifestyle is his choice. But see how they have labeled, they always try to label anybody who is on the opposite side. They made Big Oil the villain in the oil crisis. Big Oil was not the villain. They make me a villain if I say I don't believe in gay marriage. Well, you're, you're homophobic. You're against... No, I'm not. I don't support their lifestyle, but that's their own choice. But I don't, I don't believe in gay marriage. Yeah, I mean, look at, the I, flap, look at the flap over the girl in the Miss America deal or whatever. Matter of fact, isn't it an amazing thing? Do you even know who won the Miss America? No. No. Nobody does. All they're doing is talking about the girl who lost it because she did not believe in gay marriage. Oh, I thought she was the winner. See, no, she's the she only lost. one. I've... Okay. Yeah, she's the only one anybody remembers. Okay, but they got on her about how uh, the hate deal and yada 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 yada. She just said, "I don't believe in gay marriage." My gosh, she gave an opinion, and and the guy mocked her for it. He mocked her for it, and blogged it. And there's been more publicity for her, and it, it ter- turned out wonderful for Donald Trump because nobody pays any attention to that thing anyway. It can't even make a major network. They got more free publicity than they've ever got just over that deal. But the bottom line is nobody even knows who won the damn thing. All they're talking about is the girl who made the remark, who happens to be a beautiful girl. The next thing, oh, my gosh, she showed her tits on a photo shoot when she was a teenager. Well, my gosh, in America, that ought to put your ass somewhere in jail. I mean, we ought to make that a crime. I mean, give me a break. I mean, if you talk about our today, and that's something, I mean, anybody in modeling, I don't, yeah, I, do I think they should? No. Would I want my daughter? No. But I'm not going to be the one throwing the rock at the person that's doing it, you know, when the whole industry that they're in is doing it. Well, like you say, Bill, they've manipulated America where you can have a point of view one way, but you can't have the same, uh, you can't have the point of view coming back the other way. No, because you see, so what they do, they do not, you know, we've lost the moderates. 
you know Joe Lieberman makes a lot of sense. But do you ever hear him on the TV? No. Here's what they do. If you don't throw bombs and make accusations and say polarizing remarks, television loses your phone number. And so all we hear is the bomb throwers, where we need to hear the moderates. All Democrats aren't bad. I'm sorry. All Democrats aren't bad. I don't think all Dem- I don't think Republicans have a monopoly on God. But to hear some people tell it, you'd think they did. That's how polarized it is. It's always attack and label. And we lose the ability to have moderation. And so we're losing something for our country. And I don't know what the hell that has to do with wrestling, but it's interesting that we got into that conversation. Well, it's what we're living today, and it, I think it does have something to do with your experience at Turner and uh, just the right. mental. Well, I'm the, okay with it. I mean, I'll say yeah. what I think anyway. Yeah. I, I'm still outspoken. And I think now corporate America has shown its hand, and that is that it's not self sufficient, that it needs to come to the government on hand and knee and beg for our future. No, 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 it doesn't. If they let the if they let the system take care of it, we'd work through it sooner. We would work through it sooner. It makes it worse for us to prop them up. To prop them up, then you don't get the true picture. It's just like I talked about the megatrend. How do you get to the end of the megatrend until you get the true picture? Because what they're doing with the propping them up, they're throwing in a new ingredient that takes away the way they analyze what's really happening. Let them go down the tube. There should be nothing too big to fail. Well, I have the feeling, Bill, we're about to see the second phase of this where they were propped up. A lot of American... Oh, uh, and, yeah. and now I, you start to look at the news and you start to see the reality, and that is that you know, GM is not being fixed by the government being uh, its sugar daddy. No. No, and, it's, and that's what's part of the scary thing. I mean, it takes more than that. And then GM still hasn't got the message. But let me tell you something. Stop and think. GM can't close a plant without the union's permission. They can't quit producing a model of a car without the union's permission. I mean, it's, they've made bad deals when they had big market share, and they're eating them now. And, they, and I'll tell you what, if I was GM, I'd want to go bankrupt. Why? Because you're not going out of business, you're just restructuring, and the first thing you do is you, you get out of the union contract and you drop all the retirement and the health care into the government's lap, yeah, everybody that's got it gets screwed. But you come out stronger. You know, I mean, if I was running that company, I'd want the government to leave me alone so I could file bankruptcy and restructure. I could get my company in a lot better position. Well, that opportunity has come and gone because the bankruptcy they're planning now is so heavily influenced by government that I fear that GM won't be able to make it. Uh, yeah, but did you look at the deal? Which one was it? Chrysler did they? Chrysler is now merging with Fiat. Fiat can't even hardly keep afloat in, 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 in Europe anyway. Yeah, Fiat is the savior of the American auto oh, are industry. are you kidding? They're so bad that they're almost under. And then the, what, how much did the unions get? Now, how do you figure you're going to make business come good with the unions and more power? I just don't. I don't get it. Roger Penske wanted to buy Saturn, and instead, it looks like Saturn is going to be sold to Renault. Beautiful. Well, again, you know, when you get politicians, first of all, stop and think. Obama's never even run a Kool Aid stand that's made money. He's always sucked off of the political system, and that's what's happened. We got professional politicians. Why? Because first of all, all of a sudden, they're going to castigate you and accuse you of everything, because no successful businessman doesn't have a skeleton in his closet. So generally the best qualified people can't even run because they can't put their family through it. So we're, we are paying the price by having a bunch of professional politicians up there, and the only thing they know is to suck us dry and for them to cut, take their share, figuring that they'll just be there. And, but right now America may be in the crisis, the worst crisis it's ever been. we got an en- enemy that is committed to killing us all. So it may be a different deal. I hope not. I hope I'm not here to see it. Thank you, Bill. It's been Thank a you. pleasure. All right. Tremendous interview. Cowboy. Uh, oh, your website, Bill. Uh, www.cowboybillwatts.com. And hopefully, Bill, you can join us again. you got a great website and a lot of interesting information about there, up there about you, your life, and your feelings. Okay. Thank- well, yeah, and, and I'm so, you know, I'm so... Uh, reluctant to share my feelings i keep hiding it because i want to be politically correct that's that's really my goal i hope i maintain that position today
<laughs> hey, have a good day, Bill. We'll you talk too, soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>